Okay, I think it looks like we're pretty much there with um, all of the attendees. So good evening, everybody. I hope you're well and uh, keeping safe in yet another uh, lockdown. We were just saying um, kind of just before you guys joined that perhaps this this is quite a topical um, topic uh, at the moment and perhaps something that can be um, sort of implemented in a home training plan. So hopefully um, you'll, you'll find um, some of the content that is, is usable um, in the current circumstances. Um, so yeah, welcome to the, the Competitor's Ultimate Guide to Motorsport Fitness with guest speaker Kevin Hoyes, who is the Head of Sports Science at iZone Driver Performance. My name's Katie Baldwin, I'm from Motorsport UK and I will be here to kind of um, monitor the Q&A and I'll help to field any questions at the end for Kevin. Um, just before we begin, a few housekeeping points to note. Um, if you don't mind, just thank you. Um, please be aware the webinar is being recorded. It will be available afterwards on the Motorsport uh, UK website. So if you do miss anything, um, you can revisit the session and that should be online by the end of this week. Um, as mentioned, there'll be an opportunity for questions and there's a Q&A function, which you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you'd like to ask any questions, please post them on here and they'll either be kind of answered naturally through the session or um, when Kevin uh, pauses to take questions at the end. Um, that's all from me for now. So uh, enjoy the session and I will now hand over to Kevin. OK, uh, hello, everyone. Yeah, so um, I thought I'd uh, start off by uh, introducing myself, uh, let you know a little bit of um, my background and, st and stuff like that. So. Um, yeah, obviously, as Katie said, I'm, uh, I work at iZone Driver Performance. Um, I've worked there for, I think, about eight years now. So obviously in that time, kind of worked with um, quite a wide range of drivers, really. Um, so lots of different kind of categories of racing. Um, and also um, my background kind of prior to that was in sports science. Uh, so um, I did a degree in sports science at the University of Northampton. I live in the Northampton area, so... Uh, I zones close to me at Silverstone um, and uh, also I did a master's uh, in uh, uh, elite performance as well um, which is while, whilst I've been working at iZone. Um, so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about that research that I've done today uh, in the first part of uh, the webinar. So um, I, I did kind of like a paper that uh, was published on uh, uh, motorsport fitness so we're going to go through that and um, go through like the key things that we found when we looked into all the kind of re scientific research that has been done on that area uh, and really for for you as drivers what are the things that you should take away from that um, then part two um, so a little bit later on um, as Katie said at the start <laughs> we're in another lockdown again which uh, provides some kind of challenges uh, with training. Also, we're, we're in pre-season. So I wanted to um, basically discuss some kind of strategies, some tips, things that you can take away and kind of Im hopefully implement straight away. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk about how we can train effectively in lockdown, make the best of a bad situation, uh, but also what kind of things are important for pre-season training as well. Um, yeah, so I didn't want to spend like, loads of time talking about how to get the most out of training in a gym environment because you might not be able to do that for a few months or, you know, whenever it is. Uh, and then obviously, yeah, Q&A at the end. So if you've got any questions about any uh, anything that I'm going to go through, uh, feel free to ask or anything that I missed that uh, you're hoping I might uh, have covered and uh, I haven't. So, yeah, feel free at the end to, uh, to ask. All right. So let's get started. Um, so yeah, um, part one then, we're going to uh, talk about this study that I, uh, I did as part of uh, my master's. So um, it was called Fit to Race, Identifying the Balance, the Type and Sources of Knowledge in Fitness for Motorsport. Um, so really, the, the kind of idea of doing this was actually um, really just to kind of summarise what the, the study was. It was really a survey. So we tried to ask as many drivers as possible, but also some there were driver coaches involved and mechanics and engineers really just asking their opinion on fitness um, in for drivers. You know, what's important? Why do you think that? Uh, where do you get your information from? Um, so <clears throat> um, uh, uh, also the, the other thing, like it says on the slide there, 
um, actually drivers um, have quite rarely been studied in scientific research. Uh, so like when I was doing my research, it's not compared to, well, there is some, I'm not going to, you know, it's not like there's nothing at all, but com compared to other sports, um, it's, you know, there's not as much available as there would be in other sports. It's, um, fitness is kind of an area that wasn't kind of considered that important in motorsport up to more recent times. And then it's become, you know, more of a, a thing that's um, been looked into uh, and it's, you know, more and more it's becoming uh, seen as more important. Um, and, and obviously it kind of filters down from the top. So in Formula One, you know, fitness of, since the days of like Ayrton Senna, it's been seen as, um, you know, important. And then it's kind of gradually filtered down through all the different formulas in there. But also part of the problem is, you know, in, in Formula One or WRC or that elite level, everyone's looking to get an edge over the other. So <clears throat> sometimes some of the, the work that's done in those areas, we don't necessarily uh, find out too much about it. Um, um, and sometimes, uh, I'll probably, I think this is probably mentioned a bit later on, but sometimes a lot of some of the information that does come out might be quite promotional. You know, F1 drivers always have sponsors. Uh, they might, you know, and you get like articles come out about fitness they're doing and you're like, well, are they actually doing that for their performance or is this just a deal they've got with a certain uh, company that uh, wants to promote this? Um, so yeah, the, there's kind of different things. So we thought we'd just ask drivers the question, what do you think is important for what you race in um, and why and where do you get your information from? Um, and we wanted to compare that, what, what people thought, with actually what does the research say? So that's what I'm going to go through now, the different areas of fitness and, and kind of what the research says in those areas. Um, so <laughs> just before that, actually, um, the other, there's a few kind of important kind of considerations uh, in fitness for motorsport. So uh, one, one thing that we were kind of interested in was the balance between the components, because to make fitness training specific for your sport, um, you've kind of got to balance it in the right way. You can't just train all areas of fitness equally. Um, it's got to be kind of targeted in a specific way uh, to the needs of that sport. Um, and also how much, uh, so you can see like a pie chart there, obviously those are quite equal segments. <laughs> uh, then there's obviously, that, that's just like a, a, a basic image I've found on the internet. There's obviously more components of fitness than that. But obviously in a, realistically you'd have segments of different sizes, um, areas that you're gonna focus on more than others. Um, so we want to look at how can we um, decide on that for motorsport? And also how much does it vary between the different formulas of racing? Uh, so if you look at other sports um, like football, for example, you might have players in different positions and they might train their fitness in slightly different ways based on their playing position. So do we need to uh, apply like a, a similar approach to drivers? Um, and like it says at the end there, motorsport is particularly unique due to the, the kind of vast range of different events, different cars. Um, and the, I think there's a slide here. Yeah, just uh, this was a few years ago. So um obviously <laughs> the other thing to this is um cars change every year so <laughs> sometimes the way you train might change from one year to another you might race in the same championship but the car's different so there's a lot of things a lot of variables in uh, in motorsport compared to other sports so you've got um just just quickly you've obviously got the car is one thing you've got the race distance the race time Things like such as the country you're racing can, can, can be a factor as well, time of year, um, number of races in the season, the gaps between the races, top speeds, G-forces, uh, specific characteristics of the car, power steering, ABS, all these sorts of things to, to think about when we're uh, deciding what is important to train fitness-wise. So it's really complex and, and probably more complicated than uh, a lot of other sports in terms of figuring all this out. Um, also, we wanted to look at what are the purposes of fitness uh, training for motorsport. Uh, and we came up with basically two main reasons we need to do things. Um, and we came up with, with two terms. So I just thought, we'd, uh, I thought I'd explain these first before we go on. Um, the first one 
we called uh, hygiene factors. Now, basically, it sounds a little bit weird, but um, this means that these are components of fitness where you only need them to a certain extent and you're not necessarily going to get like loads of additional benefit by going way over what you need. So an example of this would be uh, neck strength for, for drivers. Um, so obviously there's a certain amount required depending on what you're racing in. Um, but then does it need to be, you know, way, 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 way over the top? Would that time be better spent on training other areas? Uh, and, you know, you might have uh, opinions on different uh, components of fitness like cardiovascular endurance, flexibility. You know, do you need them to a certain level or do you want to, is it a case of more the better? Um, and they, this can be down to opinion. I'm going to talk about that when we cover each different component, like what I think what people thought, what the research might suggest. Um, performance factors, that's the, the flip side. Performance factors, these more contribute more directly to the outcome. The more an individual has, the better. Um, so if you take reaction times, for example, I don't, I don't think there's too much uh, argument about reaction times, like the, the quicker, the better. So we'd wanna train reactions to be as fast as possible. Uh, and arguably these could uh, differ from formula to formula or driver to driver, and it can be down to a matter of opinion uh, to the drivers or to their trainers. Um, but I'll talk about that a little bit more when we go through each component. Uh, so I think I already mentioned most of this so far through it. The study itself, we, we, we aim to ask a lot of drivers. So it's got how many drivers do you ask there? Some were trainers, some were coaches, some mechanics and engineers. So what did we ask them? We asked them what they thought was important fitness wise, also what the balance between them was. So basically we said they had 100% to play with and they had to give a percentage to each area of fitness. I think we broke it up into is about 11 areas, something like that. Uh, so they had to give say cardiovascular endurance if they gave that 20% and they had 80% to spread through the other areas. So they had to actually balance out of how important they thought each area was they couldn't just give everything oh that's a 10 out of 10 <laughs> you have to actually think about uh, which areas <clears throat> you needed to work on um, and then we asked whether they thought they were a hygiene factor or a performance factor uh, and also we asked where they would get their fitness information from so did they use the internet scientific research trainers talk to other drivers word of mouth uh, whatever they found like the, the most useful way of getting this information. Uh, and yeah, then we backed up the findings with actual research. So let's go through them. So cardiovascular endurance then. Uh, this was um, when we asked the drivers what was most important. This came out as top. Um, <clears throat> uh, well, in, in pretty much all, all the categories, there was only, I think, two out of four uh, two out two of the categories that uh, it, it wasn't considered the top and that was in karting um, and <clears throat> I think there was one other um, but yeah majority of them it was really high up or you know usually at the top um, now in terms of the evidence on this uh, single seated drivers have been found to experience a significant uh, significant cardiovascular stress with a similar VO2, which is basically how much oxygen you're using. It's a maximal oxygen uptake uh, and heart rate responses uh, to running at eight to 10 minutes per mile pace. However, um, like obviously that's a single seat is there. There's not like loads of research really in how um, much your cardiovascular system is involved in different formulas. Um, usually it's based on heart rate monitoring. Um, However, the problem with that is heart rate isn't necessarily like an indicator of the physical demands. Um, so because <clears throat> in some cases they've found high heart rates, even like at low speeds. Uh, so obviously you've got um, elements of psychological stress coming in there. So a, just the release of, adren a release of adrenaline, adrenaline, sorry, um, that's making your heart rate go up. And, and we see this as well, obviously, uh, those of you you know where I work, I zone drive performance. Um, we monitor drivers in the simulators with heart rate monitors, and you can see driving a simulator is kind of pretty similar to driving the real car, obviously without the movement and the, and the g forces. But um, you know you see much lower heart rates than you would in real life, um, and that's the the biggest reason for that is the adrenaline factor. Um, 
so yeah it's not always like a, an, a key indicator um so you have to bear that in mind also there was a large range of opinion between uh, between people when we asked them on this some people thought it was like zero percent so not important at all whereas others gave it 90 percent. so it was literally like pretty much the only thing you need to be doing um when we average it out we'd say um most people's opinion was it was about 10 to 25 percent of your training needs to be focused on this area uh, and most people considered it to be a performance factor um so the more the better um so just go sorry just go to that and go back to that um in my opinion it could be arguable um i would just kind of put out there if you think of like a formula one driver um you see kind of uh, quite a few of them do like triathlons and stuff like that or ironmans or a lot of drivers in the past have um whereas some others might not seem to do that as much so if you take i think like some famous ones like mark Webber, jensen button i think they used to do a lot of ironmans and triathlons i don't think you see lewis hamilton doing them as, as much though so the thing to think about is yes there's definitely some required but is someone that does an ironman or a triathlon getting an additional benefit to someone that can do you know a decent 10k run or decent like 20k or whatever you know is there a point where this becomes like you're spending too much of your time doing it and you could have a better balance by balancing uh, doing some other training instead of just doing like full attack at this um so yeah my, i would probably go more it's probably more of a hygiene factor but like i said it's down to opinion most people we ask would say this is the more the better um, so uh, coordination and reactions, this was our next top one. They're, I'm going through them in order of how important people said they were. Um, so coordination was rated highly, second to cardiovascular endurance. Again, there was a large range of opinion though. Uh, some said it was important for car handling and others questioned whether it could actually be trained outside of the car. Uh, whereas reactions, uh, that was, uh, rated highly and there wasn't as much range so most people agreed that this was important now in terms of the research on this um there's there was uh, shown to be an association between reaction times and fine coordination so these two are suggested to be kind of linked and also um in a study where elite drivers were compared to junior drivers and physically active people um, so not people that just sit, sit around all day, people that do actually train in other sports. Um, uh, lead drivers were found to perform better at reaction tests and coordination tests. So that suggests that, you know, these are required for elite, to get to elite level in motorsport. Um, and yeah, people agreed that these are performance factors. So the more of, the, uh, more of these you have, the better. And yeah, I would definitely go along with that for these ones. Um, then you've got upper body strength or strength endurance. Um, so obviously it's important not to get um, strength endurance confused with cardiovascular endurance. Here we're talking about, you know, muscular contractions and be able to perform them over a long period of time. This was rated uh, highly across formulas. Uh, so the things we're talking about here are, you know, you need them for a strong neck, upper body, dealing with uh, high G forces. Um, and also the other um, factor might be to reduce risk of injury. So um, if you think of injuries from collisions, so we need neck strength to deal with G-forces, but if you're in a crash, you actually might be able to have a better chance of recovering from that crash quickly if you've got the, uh, a strong neck and you're not gonna um, you know, be as effective for as long as someone that might be a bit weaker in that area. Um, so yeah, people um, did kind of agree on this, that there was more of a hygiene factor. You need it to a certain extent, uh, but then you might not necessarily any additional benefits going away over the top. And yeah, I'll definitely agree with that. Um, obviously we don't need to be like, as a driver, we don't need to be strongest man in the world kind of level or even bodybuilder type of, type of level. And we've got that consideration, what kind of um, body type do we want as well? We want to be quite lean. Um, but yeah, when we're talking about this like hygiene factor, how much do we need? 
I would say we always want to have a little bit above uh, than what is actually required. You want to have a little bit in, in reserve. So we're not always like on the limit. Um, uh, and also a lot of drivers that I work with as well, we're always kind of looking a little bit of, ahead of the game. So it might not just be a case of what they're racing in this year, but more to kind of what their long-term goal is. You might want to start training towards the, you know, almost a season ahead of where you want to be uh, because you don't want to be playing catch up with fitness you don't want to be in a car and you're struggling and then you, you're trying to train to catch up to get there you want to be ready for the next step so when that test comes along you know you you are up to speed straight away um, then we've got core stability um, so of the remaining components that we've got left uh, this one ranked slightly higher than the others um, now, this is potentially uh, important uh, due to kind of injury prevention and um, the exposure you get to vibrations in the car. Um, and lower back pain was reported as one of the most kind of common injuries, particularly in rally drivers, when you've obviously got a more exact, exaggerated effect of those kind of vibrations and impacts. Um, and yeah, the research suggested that uh, rally drivers have greater core strength than uh, other physically active controls. Um, they didn't uh, find any difference between uh, kind of norm, uh, single seater drivers and normally trained people, um, which is kind of interesting. But um, yeah, with a, a lot of drivers that I've worked with, we definitely do uh, regard this as an important area. Uh, and in the research, you've got to remember they didn't just compare it to ordinary people. These were well-trained people anyway. So it's still got to be trained to a decent standard, even if they didn't find that difference. Um, and also uh, thinking about other categories like karting, we find it's quite important as well, especially as you're not strapped in and you can get pretty high G-forces in karting as well. Again, this was considered a hygiene factor, so needed to a certain level, uh, not necessarily needing to go way over that. Uh, then we've got leg strength and leg power. Now, in our study that we did, um, not many drivers mentioned this at all, really, which uh, was, was kind of quite surprising to me because in my work at iZone, um, this is something we've actually worked on a lot. And we even developed a brake training machine to help drivers with this. Um, now, it might have just been a case a lot of drivers just don't realize it or didn't even think about it when they were asking, like filling in my questionnaire. Um, but yeah, obviously it's uh, form, very formula specific. So single seaters, uh, G, some GT cars, some touring cars, um, they can require really high brake pressures. So things that are important there is, is the strength you can produce with your, with your legs. So calves, quads, glutes, um, uh, but not just the strength, but also the power, which means how quickly you can produce that strength. Um, so I don't know if you can see on the screen there, it's, but I think I've probably gone out of my slide, but there is like a brake trace on the right hand side there. So basically when you hit the brake pedal, you want to get up to peak pressure as quickly as possible. In, in some cars, it's, it's not obviously not the same in every single uh, car. Um, so, you know, you can require quite a lot of uh, leg power and leg strength to do that, uh, depending on how much bar you need to uh, get to. So yeah, this can be really important in certain, uh, certain circumstances. So it's quite interesting that this wasn't mentioned when we talked to drivers, but um, working in the field and uh, myself with drivers, this is something that we, uh, we have to uh, look at quite a lot. It is though, yeah, hygiene factor, uh, it is only needed to a certain point, but like I said earlier, you probably wanna have a bit over what you need. Um, okay, now, uh, just to cover off the rest, so these were like the smallest areas that people mentioned, uh, but I thought I'd just kind of talk, talk through them a little bit anyway. Uh, you've got balance, agility, hand foot speed. Um, so these ones together with reaction and coordination uh, are what um, I refer to as psychomotor skills. Um, so basically um, <coughs> that kind of, th these, these are components of fitness that we call psychomotor skills. Um, they tend to be um, things that drivers don't really think about that much sometimes, and they're often overlooked. So yeah, like I said, it's balance, agility, coordination, hand foot speed, 
uh, those kind of things. Um, they can be quite tricky to train, actually. So um, I don't know if, if any of you have ever been to ISO. We tried to kind of give lots of ideas for these of how to train them and how to make them relevant to fitness. But yeah, it's not always all about just strength and endurance. Some uh, these things can be important as well. Um, and again, it's all about getting that balance between all, all the areas in, in an appropriate way. Uh, also with the psychomotor skills, um, it's kind of, um, I should have put a picture in of this to try to explain it, but from a young age, when you're um, you know, going through school and you might be competing in different sports, uh, the general kind of recommendations nowadays is to try and um, get kind of like a broad base of, of motor skills. Uh, so it's recommended to actually like compete in various different sports and not kind of over specialize too much. Um, so if you if you think of someone young that's karting from you know, like a really young age and doesn't do anything else, doesn't do PE, doesn't do any other sports even for fun, you're going to end up with like an athlete that's quite narrow in terms of their skills and they won't have very good kind of body awareness, very good coordination uh, and things like that you pick up from playing things like ball sports. Um, so those things are actually really important to develop and it's never too old to learn, uh, you, you never get too old to, to broaden these easy, easier to uh, either to uh, learn new skills. Um, and if uh, there's examples of this in sport as well. So if you look at like Olympic athletes, um, you, you get some that have kind of competed to a really high level in one sport, and then they might actually switch to a different sport and then still be able to compete at a high level. It's because some of these uh, psychomotor skills are transferable, and then it's just building the specifics off of that. Um, so yeah, we call this kind of like a skills base. Uh, and basically, if you think about like a tower, do you want it tall and narrow and it can topple over easier? Or do you want nice and wide, more like a pyramid shape and it's really solid? Uh, so that's what we try and get with these kinds of skills when we're working with drivers. Uh, flexibility. So, um, oh, so let me just go back. Uh, this one, um, I think it's more something that's in the background, really. It's not something you think about, obviously, when you're in the car that's needed. Uh, but obviously you do want to be comfortable uh, and I think it's important in terms of in your training so to be able to tr uh, train at a high level you do need a good amount of mobility and flexibility and to reduce your risk of injury whilst you're training but yeah definitely I'd agree that is a hygiene factor um, only needed to a certain point now um <clears throat> Okay, yeah, I've just uh, I think I covered all the hygiene facts a bit there, so I won't cover that last point too much. Right, uh, then to come on to sources of information. Um, so this is when we ask drivers where they get their, their info from. Now, we found that most people got uh, their information on kind of word of mouth. Uh, so basically, like, taking other drivers' opinions. So it might be a driver that's raced in that uh, series before. Uh, and they've kind of told them what things are important. Uh, it might be also internet sources as well. Um, and also uh, from our study, drivers said they had quite a high level of confidence in the information they got from other drivers. However, just a word of warning with that, um, obviously you saw earlier when we talked about cardiovascular endurance, there can be a really big range of um, opinions. So one driver said it was 0% important and one driver said it was 90%. And we even saw that when drivers were even racing in similar sorts of racing as well. Um, so just kind of, I wanted to just give a little bit that you can take away from this. When you are trying to put all the information together and thinking about your training program and what things are important, I think it's a really good idea to kind of get as many sources of information as possible. So yes, certainly it's a good idea to speak to other drivers that have driven it before, but maybe not just one, <laughs> you know, maybe get a few opinions, but obviously speak to fitness ex experts uh, as well. Um, obviously, ideally those with experience in motorsport, um, <clears throat> coaches as well, you know, they might have some input. 
Um, so yeah, don't just kind of go off, oh, one driver said this, so yeah, I'm going to do that. You know, let, get as much information from many different areas as, as you can. Um, right, so that's uh, part one. Hopefully that all kind of made sense. Um, but now we're going to come into part two, which is kind of uh, dealing with the current situation. So hopefully I'm going to be able to give you some kind of key information that you can take out from this. Um, so the, the two areas like, so obviously we're in, we're in lockdown, which presents its own challenges. So we're, we've got to think about how we can uh, train from home effectively. Um, or well, obviously we can go outside to exercise as well, but obviously we haven't got the access to the, to the gyms that we uh, would normally have. Uh, but the other thing that I thought I would uh, discuss as well is pre-season, because uh, that's the, the point of the season we're in at the moment. And obviously there are certain uh, things that we should be looking at in terms of our training in a pre-season um, time, rather it might be a little bit different to during the season. So I thought I'd just uh, go through that and uh, uh, explain how that might differ different times of the season as well. Okay, so the first thing um, I, I wanted to go through is goal setting. So uh, this applies really to, to both of those that I just mentioned. This is important for lockdown, but it's also important for pre-season. It's important for fitness in general. Um, so... <laughs> just like all areas of performance so whether this is the driving side or your um you know the mental side you should set specific fitness goals um it's the ideal time to do this the ideal time of year to do this as well with it being pre-season um so what areas do you want to focus on during pre-season uh, pre which aspects will be most important to what you're racing in this year um so sometimes and the first thing when a driver comes see me, uh, you know, this would be part of my uh, kind of question to them, you know, what, what are you looking to improve? Sometimes I go, oh, everything. I want to get better at all areas of fitness. Well, unfortunately, it's not always possible to, to do that. So really, it's important to be specific. Uh, so, you know, what areas are really are going to be of the most benefit? Um, and which are going to make the most difference to performance? Um, so it's not just about which ones are going to make you look better, which ones are actually going to make you uh, potentially a quicker driver. Um, <clears throat> also, make sure you know the goal of each individual training session. So obviously we're going to set a, a kind of long term goal, which might be um, kind of where we want to be towards the end of the season fitness wise, or it might be from now until the start of the season. But also your training uh, sessions should also have like individual goals to them. So you want to know what the purpose of that session is. Um, that will mean you're more committed to that session and you're going to get more out of it. And not every single session can be, I'm just going to try and go faster or I'm going to try and lift more. You know, it, it can't work where you're doing more and more and more every time. You've got to have slightly different um, purposes to each sessions during your training week. Otherwise, you're just going to end up kind of overloaded, really, uh, too too much. Um, you can't go faster and faster and faster every single time. Uh, it might be building distance one time. One time might be working on strength. Another one might be mobility. So it's important to have those sessions throughout the week which have slightly different goals. Um, and like any other goals, you might have seen this before, it, it, it kind of um, applies to goals in any area, uh, whether it's business. Uh, they have got to be measurable. So, um, you know, it isn't pointless having a goal unless you can actually, you know, measure it in distance or speed or reps or weight or whatever. You know, don't be too um, kind of general. So you can't actually uh, decide when you reach that goal or not. Uh, and obviously make sure that it is attainable and realistic. He wants to stretch you a little bit, but don't make it so difficult that you've got no chance of reaching it. Um, and it's a good idea to have a, you know, long term goals and a series of short term ones uh, to hope you take to that as well. <laughs> uh, and also related to that is um, how you record your training as well. Um, I, I kind of uh, I've spoken to some drivers before and 
sometimes they fall into a bit of a rut really where they would like just to give you an example you might have a route that you go out on a jog for every day for example um, and you might not really know how far it is you just do it and you might not really know how fast you're running um, so even though yeah you're getting out and doing the training it's kind of just going through the motions because you're not really thinking you, you well you don't know you don't know what you're doing you don't know if it's uh you know how high intensity is you just do it and it, it can be the same when you train at a gym or at home you have a, a workout that you do and then you do that every time you go but you're not really thinking about you know you're not recording what you've done you're not thinking can i progress it you're not thinking is this challenge enough you, you're just doing it you're just going through the motions um so um my recommendation in terms of like lockdown is um using uh, apps like strava um there are others as well or using like your fitness watches your phones heart rate monitors things like that um when you're doing your outdoor exercise um and actually using those to record what you've done now as i said a, a moment ago it might not always be a case where you're just trying to go faster and faster every single session uh, that's not realistic but at least you will know the distance you've done and then when you come to do it you can at least try oh i'm going to try and match that i'm going to try and beat it or you might decide right i'm not worried about my time this session but i'm going to try and build up the distance this session or i'm going to do interval training instead uh, so you've, you've got a better picture of actually what you've achieved and when you look back at your training you can see what you've done and then plan on uh, what's next uh, and the same really applies to when you're doing your strength training uh, whether it's with actual weights or whether you're just doing body weight training at home and um, you want to be able to keep some sort of note really of uh, it might be the amount of weight you've lifted it might be um well definitely the exercises you've done uh the sets the reps might be timed a timed exercise um so we don't want to just aimlessly complete that exercise or just follow a youtube video and don't actually record what you've done because when you come to repeat that session you might actually just be doing like way below um or you know you, you might not be pushing yourself as hard as you could be um, so by having that just written down, you've all you've got that motivation to at least match it next time, um, and you you get a better feeling for how you, how your body is as well. You'll be able to like, okay, I've done the same amount, but it felt a lot easier than last time. So it's it's a good way to keep track of how you are progressing, and also it enables to know when we can actually progress the exercises, make them more difficult, or that exercise is too easy now. I need to change something else. So yeah, recording your training is really important. Um, and also this is related to those, those two really. Um, there's something called periodization. Uh, this is really relevant to pre-season training. Um, and it is made very much trickier by, uh, by lockdown, but hopefully I'll uh, explain how we can get around that. Now periodization is basically splitting your training up into different blocks different periods so realistically you can't train the same thing over and over for the whole year um you what happens is you plateau you 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 will improve to a certain point uh and then you might just stay where you are or maybe even dip a little bit and also with with being like an athlete motorsport athlete um it's going to be very difficult to still improve at the same rate when we get to during the season, um, especially if you've got a lot of races close together, it's gonna to be more about maintaining the fitness that you've built up. So just to, to exp uh, explain how periodization works. Um, now, there are some kind of terms which sound complicated, but they're, they're really, uh, really simple in terms of what they mean. So there's something called a macro cycle, which basically, is just your long-term goal that might be six months it might be 12 months um, and then you have a mesocycle which is like a, a period of might be a few months um, and that's like a, a, a kind of shorter term goal and it's where you're 
focusing your training on a certain a certain area and then you have a micro cycle which might be a week or an individual session and that's your goal for that week or, or those sessions now an exam example of this might be so in pre-season uh, it obviously depends on your individual circumstances your individual goals uh, this is just an example we might want to build strength or we might want to um, do lots of high volume, low intensity cardiovascular training uh, in that pre-season. Then when we come into the approach of uh, the season, um, you know, a few weeks out, testing started, then we are going more sports specific. So we're looking at more power exercises. We're looking at doing like single leg exercises for braking, more coordination and more balance. Uh, so we kind of sh shifted the balance of our training a little bit from that kind of general fitness to more sport specific. Um, and then during the season, uh, we're more about maintaining what we've done in pre-season. We're, we're maximizing our cardiovascular endurance for interval training. It might be shorter sessions, more high intensity, just because we haven't got as much time as we do in pre-season. So that's a rough idea of what periodization means. Now, <laughs> I, I have kind of uh, had the situations before. Um, I don't want to kind of be too general and say that all oh, drivers are lazy or anything like that. But yeah, I have known it for drivers really pre-season, they don't do enough. Um, and then it's kind of a few weeks before the season, then they're like, right, I'm going to really work on my fitness now. Or sometimes it might even be during the season, oh, I'm not fit enough, but I need to work on it now. That's obviously what we don't want to happen. Pre-season is the time where we want to be doing most of our training, the most high volume and the most like long sessions. It's the ideal time to work on cardiovascular endurance, definitely. Um, and then, yeah, we're in, a, we're in a better place when the season comes around and then we can be in that uh, period where it's more just maintaining what we've built in the pre-season. So, yeah, definitely have a think about that. Um, what you want to improve in the pre-season period even if it isn't locked down. Um, and then, yeah, hopefully you'll be in a better place come the start. Now, this is just like an example of how you might set that out. Um, you can see at the top, the long-term goal, um, then beneath it, the short-term, medium-term goals. Uh, and then we've got the uh, individual weeks. Um, also, uh, just thought I'd cover a couple of terms with you that um, you might have heard of or uh, you might not, but, um, step loading is the other thing which uh, can come into this now step loading is where you progress well step, step loading and progressive overload are very similar but step loading basically means week one might be like there then week two is there week three is there now so you got like that staircase it's gradually increasing it might be distance it might be speed it might be reps it might be sets it, whatever way it's stepping up um, now, like I said, it can't, you can't do that over a period of like 50 weeks. <laughs> it's just not going to be achievable. So what would happen in a periodized program is you might get to like week four and then you come back down where it's week five would be slightly higher than week one, but then it would step back up again. So it's like that kind of constant stair step. Um, but there are periods uh, where you might have a slightly easier week and it comes back down the level. Otherwise, you end up overtrained, um, or you might be high risk of injury. Um, and yeah, progressive overload also tie, ties into that. Um, the term overload, really, um, in terms of actually getting um, anywhere with your fitness, you do need to reach overload with any exercise you're doing. So the principle of that it means that you are kind of getting to a point where your body isn't used to it. So if you think of doing a bench press um and say so you do 10 at a certain weight and then you stop um but it feels like you could have got to 20 then that set of 10 is not really going to have trained you at all so what we want to be doing is um you know you want to be right there where you just feels like you could just barely do any more and then that's going to be like the new point for our body um the physiology thinks right I wasn't good enough the body's got to adapt so when you come to do it next time it's better so you've got to reach that point of overload for it to be effective um, and 
<laughs> no, it's, it's not about pushing yourself so hard that you're destroying your body. So that's why it's called progressive overload. It's a gradual process of just small, small little bits building week on week. Um, but yeah, ideally in that step process where you come back down, build it back up, back down, build it back up. Um, and that is something you can think about in lockdown as well. Um, because even if you've got no equipment and you're just doing body weight training at home, you still got to try and find a way of still having some progression in there. So just like watching YouTube videos and following workouts randomly without any structure isn't really going to be the best way about it. You still want to want to uh, have a plan uh, and then a way of, progress, of progressing it week on week, session on session. Um, so yeah, something to think about. Um, so um, I've just got this uh, slide here of like overcoming the um, the challenge of, uh, of lockdown. I think I've talked about some of these, but I'll uh, kind of mention a little bit more, a few kind of tips uh, that I've found working with drivers like throughout these different lockdowns we've had to kind of how we've approached it. Um, now, one of the big problems really is um, the kind of increased amount of time that we're inactive in these times. So more time sat down generally, I sat on the sofa watching box sets or whatever it is. Um, now, you know, sometimes I might get a client come to me like, <clears throat> you know, whatever their goal is, they might be like, I'm not really seeing much progress. I'm doing like, you know, five hours of training a week. My diet's good. It's like, if you think about the amount of time you're training compared to the amount of time that you're sat down, you're asleep. So you might be asleep for eight hours. You might then, you know, be eating for an hour. That's nine hours already. Then a couple of hours uh, watching telly. What were we at? 11. Then we might be working for eight hours. We're at 19 hours already of the day, you know, it can be quite, uh, if that kind of scale is like tilted too far, it can, it doesn't matter what training you're doing. If you're just really inactive the rest of the time, then it's going to be like really limiting to your progress. Um, so we want to try and break that up uh, as, as much as possible. Um, so some, some things that I find work quite well, I've mentioned this one already, the GPS tracking apps. So as well as just recording your distance, um, you can set yourself like targets with that. There's sometimes monthly challenges as well, weekly challenges. And also you've got that um, kind of competition with uh, people that you follow or like or friends that you've got using the same app as well. So that can increase like the motivation side of it as well. So I definitely advise that. You've also got, if you're lucky enough to have like a, um, uh, um, a bike, on a turbo trainer or anything like that, or um, a certain type of treadmill. Uh, there are really uh, cool apps like Zwift. I think there's others like, uh, like that as well, where uh, what you're doing is kind of put into a computer by Bluetooth, uh, and then you're on the screen and you're actually competing against other people on there at the same time. Um, some of you might have already used that, but if you haven't heard of it uh, and you have got a road bike, then I'll definitely look, in, uh, look into that. Um, so yeah, those things can make it more interactive, more competitive and like just more interesting really. Uh, because when we're just like on our own, we can't meet up in people. We can't do like runs in groups. We can't do like, like things like, uh, if you think like a park run or like a, a running or cycling event where sometimes just being around other people actually pushes you on a little bit harder. So actually doing these kind of things on your own can just give you that extra bit of push. Now, body weight training. This is uh, pretty much all I've been doing um, in all of the lockdowns. Um, now, um, it's quite surprising actually how much you can do without any uh, equipment. So there's a lot more exercises than you might think. Um, and a lot of them can be very, very difficult. And the, the tricky thing can be like, making them progressive like i mentioned earlier um, but it but it is possible and also you might want to give yourself like little little challenges really um, new new exercises to learn new skills to learn it might might also tie into the psychomotor skills that i talked about earlier um, so it might be are there balance like things that you could be uh challenge yourself to overcome coordination type things 
uh, learning new equipment. You know, you might have a kettlebell lying around that you've never used. Uh, so now would be the time to really look into that uh, and master it. And really, we find that process of learning a new exercise or new skill. Um, you know, when you first try it, it might be really difficult. You might you might want to give up. You might feel like you can never get the hang of it. Um, but that going through that process of not giving up, keeping at it, you know, keep putting the hours in until you've got the hang of it. That is a really good way of like developing your uh, kind of mental strength as well as your kind of physical skills as well. Um, making you more of like a, a character that's hard to beat. You know, so it's a really good process to go through. Uh, also, it's a good time to work on like things like flexibility, posture, mobility as well. If you've got those areas that are always giving you trouble, tightness and stuff, you know, you've got time to work on those things. Uh, and also related to those periods of prolonged inactivity, set timers on your phone, uh, you know, every hour, every half hour, uh, and then give yourself like a little, um, you know, it might just be one exercise you do or a few exercises just to break up the day really and keep yourself active. Um, so yeah, that's uh, kind of some, some tips. Hopefully, um, oh yeah, I forgot about this slide. <laughs> I, I thought I'd uh, mention this uh, just at the end uh, because it's something I get asked quite a lot as, uh, as well. It's a little bit kind of doesn't really fit with all the uh, other things I've talked about today, but I thought I'd just mention it at the end. Um, and this is something you can actually work on now in lockdown and in the pre-season period. I do get asked quite a bit from drivers of, you know, what kind of things should I do to warm up before I get in the car? Um, some people, some drivers might not even thought about doing this. So, but yeah, it is something that we're working on quite a lot um, with our work at iZone. Now, obviously it is specific to what you're racing in and also individual preferences as well. So, um, Really, what we're trying to do is take this like approach from, you know, a high level athletes from other sports as well. So if you, if you look at pretty much anything like Olympic athletes, um, pretty much any other sport, they would all have a warm up routine. Um, and I think it is something that is coming into motorsport more and more, um, certainly at the high levels. Um, but and there, there might be still some that, you know, oh, it's pointless, I'm just going to jump in and drive. Uh, and sometimes that might work, sometimes it might not. Uh, but this is about um, increasing the chance of it going well. So the whole point of it, obviously we've got general and specific warm-up exercises to activate the body. Um, the whole point of it is, in theory, it should reduce the step-up time, which is the amount of time it takes to reach the peak level of performance. Um, so, if you jump in cold, it might take you like five laps to start really feeling good and getting getting your best the best out of you. Hopefully, with a warm up, that might be speed, sped up a little bit uh, because we're already pre primed for it. Um, there's also mental benefits as well as physical to doing this. So it's not just about getting the heart rate up, loosening up your joints and muscles. It's about having that process of um, you know this time before. The race. I'm not just wandering about. I'm not getting anxious. I'm not getting distracted. I'm not starting to worry about things going through things in my head. You're just focusing on your warm up. You know, it's keeping you focused. You've got that routine. When you're doing it every single time, it's like a switch. It's telling your body that you're about to get ready for competition. So you, you obviously want to consider the time you've got available. Um, what specific muscle groups do you want to target in your warm up? Can you replicate any of the movements? Do you want to have like a morning warm up? Uh, so first thing in the morning, do a, a, a bit of a longer one, and then you just have a quicker pre-driving one, just as a, a rewarm. Um, so just like things, uh, examples that we've used. Obviously, you see the picture there. A lot of drivers use skipping. Um, some sometimes they might not be able to do it to start with, so it's a skill to learn but uh, you can do it without a rope. You can just jump up and down on the spot. Just things like that to get the heart rate up, but then you might have more mobilization exercises for the shoulders, the neck, obviously, um, the core as well, your legs. Um, and then uh, you might want some reaction-based exercises in there, um, whether you use like a reaction ball or 
you know, um, it might be something more simple. Um, someone throwing stuff at you. Um, you might have coordination stuff in there. You might have seen some drivers juggle and stuff. That's something we've uh, we've we've tried as well. Um, you know, there's no kind of. Um, I'll never say right. This is what you got to do. This is like that exact warm up you need to do. It is individual specific. Um, so in this period, you can really get this planned out for your season. Um, if you've got a sim at home, you can practice doing a warm up before you do a. a, a a run on your sim and just get into the routine of doing it you want to have something that makes you feel confident um, and makes you feel like the right level of what we call arousal so um, you know are you fired up enough um, you don't want to be too relaxed obviously you don't want to be too fired up as well that you know leads you to crashing <laughs> you got to find the uh, fine balance of like the right kind of level of intensity that you want to be at from as a result of your warm-up so yeah, this, this is a, a, a kind of nice task that you can set yourself during this time to really get this um, prepared, ready for the season. Uh, so yeah, I think that's uh, pretty much everything I had planned to talk about. Hopefully um, it kind of made sense, uh, but yeah, we're part three, so any questions? Thank you, Kevin, that was really insightful. It was uh, good to kind of get the background on it before uh, part two. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come up already. So if anybody has any questions, please drop them in the Q&A box and, um, and I'll, I'll uh, ask them um, for Kevin. Um, this first one, I think you kind of covered it, um, but I will just go over it again. Um, cardio is always said to be super important, but I figure out that HIIT training is much more effective for me combined with weightlifting. Has this strategy changed in recent studies from shifting uh, from cardio more towards other alternatives. Okay, so there are um, there are kind of different theories on this. Um, so, like there is um, a kind of viewpoint that you need what what's like referred to as a cardiovascular base. Um, so that would be achieved by having like longer, slower training. It's called long slow distance training (LSDT). Um, so you'd be working at a slightly lower intensity for longer distances and this might be like up to an hour it might be an hour up to like two hours or even longer in some cases and this would be like your you know outdoor running cycling and that kind of stuff uh, and that increases your base level of cardiovascular fitness and then there's an argument to say once you've increased that then you could like build in the high intensity interval training off of that um, whereas if you just go straight into the high intensity interval training, it might not be as effective. Um, now, in my personal opinion, um, I would always try and get a little bit of a mixture of, um, of different sessions throughout a week. I probably wouldn't say that doing HIIT training every single session is the most effective. I would probably try and get uh, one that's a, a long, at least one session a week that's longer, slower, and working on the distance. Um, because that's going to have additional benefits um, over and into doing hit all the time. Hopefully that's answered that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Chloe has asked if um, there's any training equipment that you'd recommend for training at home. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, I would say um, probably just simple things, really. You don't need to go and break the bank. Uh, so resistance bands can be really good um and quite effective if you make sure you don't get ones that are like really ridiculously light though you might want to get a few different strengths um so yeah they're quite easy to give you variable resistance so if you think if you bought like a pair of dumbbells they'll probably get too light too quick whereas resistance bands gives you quite a good range to work with and quite a lot of different exercises you can do so they're quite um you know versatile um also, uh, if you think, uh, you know, um, Swiss ball, yoga ball, gym ball, the big bouncy balls, they're really good in terms of working on your balance uh, and core. And it's quite, again, quite a lot of a range of exercises you can do with those as well. Uh, medicine balls, maybe kettlebells as well. Um, so, yeah, just a few things like that, really. Um, I don't think it's necessarily you don't need to like break the bank and get a full set of dumbbells and barbells and a treadmill and a uh, you know a full gym going on but yeah just a few little bits like that can certainly be effective 
Brilliant, thank you. Um, Maddie has asked, um, well, firstly, she said thank you for the great session. And uh, she asked, do you have any workout plans or people that you would um, recommend on YouTube? Um, it's a bit of a difficult one because uh, I wouldn't say there's like one that I would say go to because um, there might be, you know, some that are good and then some that are not so good in the same like kind of channel. Um, now, like, um, yeah, it's quite quite a difficult one. I can't really think of one off the top of my head that I'd say, yeah, definitely go and do that. Um, like I, I did, there, there are a few apps out there as well that are quite good for giving you a workout and you'd be able to like log what you've done. I've used one called Freeletics myself, which is all body weight based training. Uh, I think there's others that are quite similar. Um, but again, even with within them, there might be some exercises that I don't think are, are as great. So it's kind of like, yeah, it's kind of like you have to just do a little bit of research and um, figure out what's appropriate. Um, I don't want to kind of turn this into self-promotion, but we are we, uh, like I am doing sessions myself on Zoom uh, three times a week as part of iZone. So if anyone, if anyone is interested in giving them a go, get in touch and uh, you can have a go at those. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, Mitchell asks, is there any general information for warming up after sleeping or resting during um, endurance races? Um, and they say that it's only their second year in motorsport and um, they're doing endurance. Okay. Um, I, I, no, I don't think there is any kind of specific research on that, but um, definitely comes down to what I talked about in having that planned uh, pre-performance routine but obviously in that situation it will be need to be a little bit more detailed in terms of having that post uh, sleep routine <laughs> warm-up routine so yeah um i don't yeah i don't think that again i can't can't think of any way i could kind of send you specifically but you'll definitely need some planning um and obviously obviously only your second year um if you can try and talk to other drivers that have been in that situation um that have done those long endurance races and what kind of strategies they used. Um, and obviously the other thing to think about it is it's not just physical warm up. Um, it's what you do mentally as well. There's obviously techniques like visualization and stuff like that that come into it. Um, there's also hydration that would run through that as well. And of course, nutrition. So you've got to think about all of those elements coming together really. Um, and, and, and planning the whole lot make, to make sure you're, uh, you know, in the best possible condition when you get re getting uh, ready for your stint. So, you know, it, it kind of depends who you've got in your like network, really. Um, and obviously in an ideal situation with an elite level driver, you would have a fitness trainer, nutritionist, um, maybe even a sleep coach, <laughs> you know, you'd have all sorts of different knowledge all coming together to create that. Uh, create that plan but if, if, if you know if it's pretty much just you doing it on your own get as much information from those types of people as you can trainers a nutritionist if you if you got access to one um and yeah use opinions from other drivers that are, have, have been in that situation as well but don't just rely on one person get get as um, much info as you can Brilliant, thank you. Um, as you've just kind of meant, touched on um, hydration, um, someone's actually asked, um, do you have any suggestions on hydration strategies on both hot race weekends and more mild ones? Okay, um, yeah, I mean, the um, there's obviously like a minimum requirement of hydration anyway, which is like the, um, you know, the two litres, uh, but obviously you do get some, fluids through what you eat as well so it's not always just about what you drink um obviously water is the best thing to hydrate yourself uh, but when you're getting in really hot climates um you want to be looking at um getting the electrolytes as well because when you're sweating a lot that's what you're losing uh, and actually just drinking water makes the situation worse because you just uh, diluting the electrolytes in your body uh, so yeah you, you'd be looking at taking uh, electrolyte sachets or tablets there's quite a lot out there uh, you want to make sure that they are batch tested though uh, for athletes uh, so there's something called informed sport it has a little yellow logo on it 
with an athlete on it. So you want to make sure you only get these types of uh, uh, supplements uh, that have been tested by those. Um, so yeah, uh, you'll be having those uh, in the uh, in your water, diluted in your water before before you race. Um, however, there are a few strategies before, like your um, getting in the car. So you don't you don't want to like down a load of water and then <laughs> need in the toilet in your stint. That's not ideal. So yeah, I think it's only recommended to have like 500 mil in the. I think it's like two hours leading up to event off the top of my head which doesn't sound a lot, but yeah, that allows enough time for hydration to occur and for you to go to the toilet if you need to. But obviously up to that point in the week leading up to it, you want to be have a decent level of hydration already rather than arriving there and have playing catch up. So again, it's about pre-planning um, again, really. Um, yeah, I think I think that covers that. Oh, the, the other things that can um, improve dealing with heat as well. I forgot to mention this when I was talking about cardiovascular endurance. There is um, research that does show um, that a higher VO, VO2 max, so greater cardiovascular endurance um, and a lower level of body fat uh, does actually help people tolerate higher levels of heat. So when they did testing, they can tolerate heat for longer and higher heats for longer. Uh, than those with a lower cardiovascular endurance and higher body fats. Uh, so that's one of the benefits of cardiovascular endurance training for drivers is dealing with the heat, uh, heat stress. Um, and also it's linked to obviously your concentration as well um, and like coordination and reaction times. Um, so yeah, just uh, reminding me there, so thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, final question that's on the on the Q and A um, from Rob. Um, do you find much variance between drivers you train at iZone in terms of how much recover, recovery time they need, e.g., three weeks progressive overload, then one week deload, or five weeks overload, one week deload? Um, uh, I think probably it's it's probably uh, it's difficult to say exactly. Um, I think the, one of the biggest issues we have, I think is it's the nature of motorsport as well, is you sometimes you have this plan where you might have three week um, step load and then like, like I said, week four or five D load. Um, and then actually it will all change because a test comes up and sometimes the test is in a different country. And then you've got a few days traveling there, a few days traveling back, and then it's pretty much a week out of your training there. So, it's very difficult in motorsport to have that plan where it's perfect and you, you, you do a certain amount of weeks and then a deload, certain amount of weeks deload. What I try and do is get like the deload uh, weeks to fall in line with uh, any events. So if it's testing or, um, you know, a race when we're in the season, I try and kind of match it up so that the um, kind of high, hardest training session would have, would have been done kind of at least a week or two weeks before that event so then it kind of fits in quite nicely to the schedule so it's all about really um looking at the schedule and uh, and seeing what works um and yeah it, it will vary individual to individual definitely and also it will vary uh what they're working on like specifically so whether you're more like strength focused or more cardio focused um so yeah there, there'll be a few things that uh, affect to affect that perfect thank you kevin thanks so much for uh, for hosting that session it was really insightful and i hope everybody found it useful um if anybody does think of any questions that they haven't managed to ask today um please feel free to send them in we'll endeavor to collate and uh, follow up with an answer afterwards um thanks again kevin thank you all very much no for tuning in um we hope you found it useful and and as kevin mentioned if you enjoyed the session and you'd like to know more from kevin and the team at izone please do get in touch either directly with izone driver performance or through the webinars uh contact email address that you've been provided with free most sport uk and we'll happily put you in touch um as Kevin said, they do offer a number of various different programmes of support that might be of interest. Um, thanks again, all. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening and take care.